it's Louisa Valla and you're watching Gatehouse Insights. On today's episode, I'm joined by Jerome, who is the author of The Wellness Doctrines, consultant and solicitor. Thanks for joining me today, Jerome. Oh, thanks for having me. So tell us a little bit about your professional journey and how it's led to your current position. So it, in, in a nutshell, my sort of legal career, um, for lack of a better term, has been a matter of making it up as I go along, in a sense. Um, so because of the health problems I experienced at the tail end of my law degree, uh, my career trajectory went in a slightly different direction than what I would have originally anticipated. And so I went from, uh, from job to job. I was in um, academic and research role. I was then at a major federal government inquiry. Um, I did some time in commercial firms as well. Um, and eventually I decided to leave uh, the full-time space to write a, write a book, a self-help guide for lawyers and law students to manage their health and well-being. And when that published, I thought that I would then go back into a real job, um, you know, like everybody else. But uh, instead I started getting asked to do uh, lectures and workshops for firms and universities discussing well-being in the workplace or on campus and so I saw, you know, saw a really cool opportunity out of that to to be an advocate for mental health and well-being issues that happen within the legal profession in Australia and it's a journey uh, that I'm still on and one that I'm you know really grateful to have had um, because I think that it's quite meaningful and it certainly gets me out of bed in the morning. Why, um, looking back, what was it that prompted you or motivated you to get into law and practice? A cynical answer to why I decided to get into law in the first place is because I could. You know, I, um, I had the marks to get into a law degree and so I thought, why not? Um, what I realised over time though was that law is actually a fundamentally important profession in our society. You know, um, as a lawyer you have a real tangible effect over the community around you or you certainly have the ability to do so and there's something quite uplifting about that idea and that's what motivates me to be in this profession. Um, and I think that with the work I'm doing now, um, my motivation is to help other lawyers um, and the law students coming through the ranks to be the best lawyers that they can possibly be because if lawyers are to have that uh, meaningful, tangible effect o over the community around them by virtue of the fact that they're in a profession that is so fundamentally important to society, then they need to be performing at their best. Um, and so if there's any little thing that I can do to help those people uh, perform at their best, then I want to be able to do that. Can you share some tips on, on what people can do to, to perform at their best? Yeah, well, I, it um, de depends on the individual in terms of the kinds of events, activities or initiatives that you might implement for yourself, but there are some pretty standard rules across the board that will apply to anyone. Um, one of them is ensuring that you get enough sleep, which is something that a lot of law students and lawyers will neglect because they will think that there perhaps just aren't enough hours in the day to, uh, to fit that in on top of doing your work or your study and extra curricular commitments, whatever they might be, um, but uh, you know, consistently research shows that sleep is so fundamentally important to your well-being on a number of levels, be it physical, emotional, intellectual and so on. Uh, so you know, my argument in this sense is you, know, you can literally and metaphorically sleep your way to the top. Um, I think having open honest communication with people in your life whom you love and trust is also really crucial. Um, I'm a strong believer in the idea that a problem shared is a problem halved and if you take the time to talk about your daily stresses and anxieties with people uh, who can offer you um, a different perspective to what you might already think then it'll, put, uh, it'll make you better placed to figure out how best you can proceed. Um, I think it's really important that you make time rather than find time for the things in your life that you love, whether it be team sport, reading books, mindfulness, meditation, yoga, anything like that. Um, it's really important to have those activities scheduled in as non-negotiable aspects of your daily or weekly life. Um, because it gives you a light at the end of the tunnel, um, it helps you properly switch off and gives you something else to focus your attention on uh, and just helps you recharge the batteries and relax so that when you wake up the next day you're going to be um, you know, refreshed and ready to go again. How does someone that's so hardwired with working and not sleeping and just keep on going and, and not scheduling time for those important things that matter to them, how do they go about reassessing things and then what do they need to do to actually execute and make those changes? It's, it's a tough one um, because you know, lawyers, statistically speaking, are much more competitive and perfectionistic um, and certainly pessimistic than people in most, if not all, other professions. And so, yeah, as you say, if you are wired that way, it is quite difficult to change. Um, and so, depending on the individual, I think it's important to uh, look at uh, look at the question from, from multiple angles. Um, 
if you're a com particularly competitive person or you're, let's say you're even a, a very ambitious lawyer, um, my argument to you is that if you're not taking the time to look after your health and well-being, then you're not going to be a productive, successful lawyer in the long term. Um, you know, you're a person first and a lawyer second, and the latter cannot exist without the former. Um, so in that sense, I think it's possible to play to people's self-interest to say that you know, if you want to be the best version of yourself that you can possibly be, you need to be doing X, Y, Z first of all to look after yourself because of the, otherwise you're going to be running on fumes and you're going to eventually burn out. I mean, Oh, sorry, I should rephrase, not everybody is going to burn out, but your chances of burnout will be increased as a result of not uh, looking after yourself. What do you do to, to I suppose, keep in control and, and unwind and stay on top of things? So there's a number of things I do um, because I recognise that uh, given my history with uh, anxiety and depression that it's really important for me to be constantly vigilant about looking after myself. So I uh, play indoor soccer and mixed netball every week with friends. I go to the gym a couple of times a week. I like to go for night walks. I will read 30 or 60 minutes every night before bed. I listen to music and podcasts and I quite like cooking and baking. Um, uh, you know, I bake a new cake every week. And it's really important for me to have those things for a number of reasons. One, um, because it helps me stay grounded, it gives me a balance in the day or in the, day or in the week. Um, and it also just adds a lot more fun to my, to my calendar. And you know, in fact, let's face it, we could all do with more fun nowadays. What's your favourite cake you've baked? Uh, well, my all-time all favourite is making chocolate brownies because it's a you know, recipe from my mum and then my grandma in Germany and so I really like doing that one on a, on a personal level. Um, but I recently mastered my white chocolate mud cake, so yeah, I'm really pleased with that one. I now know how to do ganache properly. <laughs> Next time you're down in Melbourne, you need to bring me some. Yeah, of, that. of course. Yeah, we'll <laughs> share some cake of... <laughs> together. <laughs> now you've also done freelancing legal work. Yes. How has that helped you with pursuing your passions for writing? Well, on a um, sort of, I guess, professional level, it allows me to sort of stay ingrained in the legal profession um, properly, and it sort of expands my skills in terms of policy writing, content marketing, um, and certainly uh, in, in professional networking as well. Um, but um, I think that it's also been important to stay ingrained in the physical environment because it allows me to get a, a better um, insight and perspective into whatever it is that might be going on in law firms. Um, certainly it's going to differ from, uh, from office to office and certainly campus to campus. Um, but, being, uh, re but remaining ingrained um, and being able to be on the ground, uh, on, on the front line to see what is happening is really important for me to then, uh, whenever I go to do lectures and workshops with firms or universities, to have a broader understanding of what it is that might be affecting people on an individual level. For lawyers thinking of, um, I suppose, doing some freelance work and pursuing other passions on the yep. side, what would you say to, I suppose, inspire them and motivate them to go ahead and do the freelancing work? Uh, well, I think there's a number of things that uh, make it uh, cool from an indulgent point of view. I mean, you can wear whatever you want to work for, for one thing, um, and you can dictate your own hours. And having that uh, level of autonomy and flexibility over your working schedule is a pretty cool thing and something that a lot of lawyers don't really have. And it's something that I've um, greatly appreciated. Um, but I think that it's also important to recognise the uh, fundamental differences between having a nine to five job versus being your own boss. Um, and when you're your own boss you have to be much more on top of um, your your work coming in and then as a result of that the cash flow that's coming in um, and so knowing uh, how best to budget and save is really important and you know it sounds silly but it's, it's one thing that you really do have to think about um, but the plus side of that is that you get a much better appreciation for how to be a manager or how to be a business owner and those skills are invaluable um, if and when you ever decide that you might want to go back into a law firm because you have skills that other people just won't have. Going back to the, the well-being side of things, um, in the legal profession there's a lot of talk about being more resilient to manage, yeah. I suppose, ment mental health, be a high performer and so forth, but you actually are not a fan of that word. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more. 
So for me, the term resilience implies a certain amount of tolerance, um, and tolerance by definition means that you're putting up with something that, that is there. And um, so I have problems with that on two levels. First of all, the idea that we should tolerate these existing issues that might be prevalent in the legal profession, um, and, and, and secondly, that perhaps there's nothing we can do about it, which I don't think is true. I think that the legal profession has done a, fan, a, a really fantastic job over the last 10, 15 years at certainly raising awareness of the prevalence, uh, causes and effects of psychological distress, anxiety and depression. Um, there's, there's certainly a lot more work to be done, um, but, they, but they have done a really good job at raising awareness and trying to counter these issues rather than just saying they exist, you know, get on with your life. Um, so, you know, resilience, and, and I, I'm, not everyone agrees with me on this. Um, I think that there are better ways to frame the discussion rather than using the term resilience. I think that um, trying to frame it in a more positive light is, is, um, is something that will better serve certainly the, the younger lawyers and law students coming through the ranks. You know, and, and like I said earlier, you know, playing to that idea of self-interest. You know, if you want to be a productive, successful lawyer, you first have to be a healthy, happy person. And this is how you become a, you know, a well-rounded individual in that sense, rather than trying to scare people by saying you have to be resilient because there's this you know big bad wolf that's lurking in the background of your law firm. So it sounds like self-awareness is very key, being really self-aware of what you like and don't like. Ab uh, absolutely and, and there's, there's a bit of trial and error involved in that. I mean I had to go and give mindfulness and meditation a try to realise that it wasn't going to work for me but I'm glad that I did give it a try because now I know that there are other things that might work better and I'm not saying that I'll never like mindfulness and meditation but right now I get more value out of playing team sport with my mates or reading a book every night before I go to bed. Um, and so yeah, it goes back to that idea of individual responsibility that we all need to take for ourselves um, because you know your law firm might put on a lunchtime yoga class and that's great but only if you like yoga. So you know it's incumbent upon you to figure out what it is that you're going to get value out of and do that, um, make it a non-negotiable aspect of your week. Where do you see the legal profession headed? in the next five to ten years around mental well-being, do you see it changing much more or what's your views on it? Well I think I think it will continue to change um, but only if the profession recognises that there needs to be a shift in dynamic when it comes to the conversation of mental health in law. Like I said the profession has been fantastic in the last 10-15 years at raising awareness of what the issues are but there's a second half of the conversation which needs to exist which is what can individuals do for themselves. I, I'm trying to plug that gap a little bit but the profession at large needs to be better at doing that because if we're only doing awareness raising then all we achieve is to increase somebody's anxiety because they'll say, oh no, I don't want to be that one in three who gets sick. If, they, if they're not equipped with the practical tools to look after themselves, or, if, or at the very least if that conversation isn't happening, then they're not going to be any better placed than they were before. Um, and so I think that there needs to be a much greater focus on practical solutions and strategies because at this point, just about every person in law is aware that there is a problem and we do, by virtue of being in this profession, have increased susceptibility to the issues. Um, so practical solutions and strategies is, is, is where the conversation needs to head. What can law firms, and I suppose even individuals, what can they do? Law firms, uh, I think, first of all, they need to continue uh, doing whatever in-house initiatives they might be doing, whether it be those lunchtime yoga classes or boot camps or anything like that, because it is really important that they offer their staff the opportunity to engage in activities. Um, but more importantly than that, I think it's really important, uh, I think it's fundamental that they uh, foster a collegiate, hospitable workplace environment, because it it, it, it won't make any difference if you have these activities like yoga and boot camp but then your bosses are still really coming down hard on you and you really feel the stress and pressure. Um, it would just be a box ticking exercise if that was to be the case. Um, so allowing people to feel more comfortable in their workplace, giving them the freedom and flexibility to work from home if need be, um, fostering an environment whereby somebody feels comfortable approaching their boss or supervisor if and when they are ever struggling is really important because the stigma is still hugely prevalent within law firms. Um, and there was, a, there was a research paper done in 2011 called The Elephant in the Boardroom which found that 86% of people would rather suffer in silence than approach their boss um, to tell them something was going on for fear of being fired or passed over for promotion. And that's a number that you know, really needs to be reduced. Um, 
So if somebody feels more comfortable in their workplace and they feel more supported, then I think uh, that will go a long way to addressing the issues. Um, whereas right now, I think a lot of firms and universities still just take a bit of a box ticking approach to this. Um, you know, they'll promote the idea of work-life balance, but if they're not actually walking the walk, then not a lot's going to change. Now you're also a mentor and coach to uh, law students and younger lawyers. Yeah. Can you share the story on how you got onto that path of, of mentoring others? Yeah, so it was actually quite a funny story. I was, um, I, I, I just walked up the road from where I live to, to order a pizza for dinner and I got a call from, uh, from the HR manager of one of the firms in Sydney and she said, uh, you know, do you do any coaching for, for law students? And, you know, I was on the phone to her and I said, well, I do now. Um, it's, it, she told me that, you know, her daughter was uh, struggling a bit with the transition into, into university and, you know, could I serve as a, as a mentor or coach to her? Um, and, it's, it, and so that, that, that kind of kick-started me down that route. Um, and it was sort of similar to doing the lectures and workshops for firms and universities. It wasn't an avenue that I had anticipated or you know, re really thought about before it came along, but I'm really glad that it has because um, it's something that personally gives me a lot of uh, satisfaction to be able to pass on uh, you know, my own experiences and wisdom from those experiences, um, but also provide um, an avenue of support which I didn't have myself when I was a law student and looking back now I kind of really wish I had a, a, a big brother of sorts to, to help me navigate through law school because it's uh, you know it can be a really trying time for a lot of people and you know certainly for someone who was and is as, as you know sensitive and highly strong as me it would have been really cool to have somebody sort of help you navigate through those issues um, and it's something that I really want to continue being a being a coach uh, and, and mentor to students and, and younger lawyers because I think that um, you know, with this whole conversation about depression in, in, in law or depression in society as a whole, I mean, you're never going to be able to change the world, but if you can you know, change one person's world um, through a kind word or through just being there with them in a dark time, then you know, that's a meaningful difference in itself and it's something that I'm you know, really pleased to try to do. What is, before we wrap up, what is one tip or one bit of advice that from your book that you could give to other lawyers, whether that be junior or senior lawyers, that they could implement today? Well, I think that um, the overarching idea when it comes to being a healthy, happy lawyer so that you can be productive and successful is just be kind to yourself. Um, and that encompasses just about every solution or strategy that you could possibly think of, whether it be getting more sleep, talking to people around you, doing uh, your extracurricular activities. Um, if you're not being kind to yourself, if you're being too hard and expecting too much of yourself, um, if you're not allowing yourself to detox from, from technology once you get home or detox from the office, um, and if you're expecting the world of yourself, um, you have to be at 100% every single day, then it's only going to exacerbate whatever problems you might be having. If you're kind, if you allow yourself to have those down moments and say that, you know, on occasion I'm going to you know, feel a bit glum or blue, um, but that's okay, you know, I'm allowed to have my down moments, um, but I think that goes a long way to accepting whatever issues you might be experiencing, assuming that you are, and it also makes you a much better place to deal with them if and when they do arise. Um, it takes a lot of work to allow yourself to be kind, especially for, for you know, highly strung lawyers who are competitive and perfectionistic, um, but if you do take the time to so kind of reflect on the fact that you are allowed to not be okay all the time, you know, it's okay to not be okay, um, then I think that goes a long way to uh, putting you on the path to, to proper recovery. So yeah, be kind to yourself and remember that you are a, a person first and a lawyer second. Jerome, this has been wonderful. Thank you for joining me and thank you for the amazing work you're doing within the profession. Not at all. Thanks a lot, Louise. Thanks. Now, Jerome and I would love to hear from you. What is the biggest insight you're taking away from today's conversation? Comment and share below and let us know. If you like this episode, please subscribe to our channels and share this video with your friends. And thank you for watching and I'll catch you next time on Gatehouse Insights.